The NBA during the 1970s was, well, it was pretty rough. Many reporters and basketball insiders widely refer to the 70s as the worst decade of NBA basketball. It's the least talked about, most would say it's the least exciting, and others would say the talent of the 70s was nowhere near the talent in the decades before and after. We saw guys like Bob McAdoo, Dave Cowens, and Bill Walton win MVP during the 1970s. While many hardcore NBA fans know that they're all fantastic players, some of whom saw their careers get cut short due to injuries, but the truth is, they're nowhere near the superstars from every other era. Some believe the talent pool in the league was very diluted due to the NBA and ABA competing with each other for the best players, instead of seeing them play in the same league. On top of that, drug use was everywhere, and it was also impacting everyone across the country, even outside of basketball. So how did David Stern seek to fix these issues? How did he turn basketball from a sport that many players played as a hobby, to one of the biggest, most popular sports in the entire world? And what about all his controversial decisions? How did they affect his image and the perception of the NBA? What's going on folks, my name's Andy, and with the recent passing of David Stern, I thought it's about time to give credit where credit is due. While he's made his fair share of controversial decisions, there's no doubt that he had a huge hand in helping the NBA become what it is today. A global phenomenon. In this video, let's take a look back at everything he's done. Without further ado, let's begin. In 1980, David Stern was named the Vice President of the NBA, and that was when his first ever policy was created and admissioned into the NBA's regulation. To the surprise of nobody, it was a drug testing policy. In a book by David Halberstam, he went in depth about this topic. He stated, quote, With the drug testing rule, the league in effect admitted that it had a problem and was now moving to correct it, in conjunction with the players themselves. If a player came forward voluntarily, he would retain his salary and receive treatment. If he came forward a second time, he would get treatment but no salary. The third time, the player would be gone for life. This was seen as a strict regulation at first, but it was necessary to reduce the rampant drug use across the league. While there have been multiple instances of players getting permanently banned throughout the 1980s, some of whom were starters on playoff teams, it did in fact help the drug problem. Additionally, a second policy he passed was a different version of the salary cap. In the book, Halberstam said, quote, Under the salary cap, the owners and players effectively became partners, the players getting 53% of all revenue. These were the two policies that ultimately catapulted Stern as the next commissioner of the NBA. Of course, a lot of the NBA's resurgence of the 1980s has to do with new arrivals as well, namely Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, and later on, Michael Jordan. However, Stern created the foundation for them and every other player to succeed by humanizing them. They were no longer treated as employees of a company, but more so like shareholders, who will directly benefit from the success of the sport. The new drug policy might have been harsh at first, but it simply showed that, hey, the NBA cares about your well-being, and we accept that these problems will take a while to remedy. Fast forward to February 1st, 1984. Stern officially became the new commissioner of the NBA, taking over the spot from Larry O'Brien. A few months later in the 1984 draft, Stern would make his first ever draft selection call. The Houston Rockets select Akeem Olajuwon. Around the mid-1980s, the NBA saw a surge of new talent. As a result, new dilemmas started to pop up for Stern. While the NBA has always been known as the premier league for basketball, at the end of the day, it's still a form of entertainment. In previous decades, the NBA as an organization controlled many aspects of a player's image. Owners and fan bases prioritized the team identity over the individual players. He believed the best way to market the sport was to allow individual stars to shine, to show their personalities in the spotlight and create their own brands for themselves. That's why the rise of sneaker deals started around this time too. While there have been deals before with brands like Converse, we would now see the rise of Nike and Adidas. This was a huge turning point because players were encouraged and had the freedom to go out and get their own contracts. 
players were no longer looked at as commodities. It's things like this that allowed them to embrace their individuality. Michael Jordan single-handedly turned Nike into the biggest sports brand in the entire world. And even today, you can't think of Jordan without thinking of the Jordan brand or the Jumpman logo. By the late 1980s, Stern was starting to expand the game globally. At this point, outside of America and certain European countries, not many people were interested. One of the biggest deals was with China. In 1988, Stern visited China for the first time and signed a deal with CCTV, a Chinese broadcasting network which allowed NBA games to be broadcasted in China. This opened a whole new market. With access to a country with over 1 billion citizens, China has slowly grown to become the biggest consumer of the NBA's brand. Stern also brought NBA players onto the international stage, like to the Olympics. Previously, America could only send amateur players, usually college players, to play for the Olympic team. But under Stern, that would all change in 1992, when the original Dream Team rose to prominence. This was another huge step in expanding basketball at the international level. In an article by ABC, it was reported that, quote, under Stern, the NBA would play nearly 150 international games, and be televised in more than 200 countries and territories, and in more than 40 languages, and the NBA Finals and All-Star Weekend would grow into international spectacles. The global influences would reach Africa as well. Nowadays, the NBA promotes a lot of games in Africa. A lot of recent NBA prospects came from Africa or Europe and other regions as well. Now the NBA demographic is more international than it's ever been before. As the years progressed, Stern would also open up a program called NBA Cares, whose responsibility is to address social issues worldwide. However, just like with every other leader, there's always some controversial decisions that have been made. One of them was the new NBA dress code implemented in 2005. Following the events of the Malice at the Palace, the NBA's image took a huge hit. Stern did not want the NBA to be associated with violence. So as a result, he, well, he banned a lot of clothing that was associated with hip-hop culture. Things like do-rags, chains, medallions, t-shirts, and jeans. If a player was injured and sitting on the sidelines, he must be wearing a blazer or a suit. In interviews and other media events, the players must follow the new dress code. Of course, this drew some controversy. Allen Iverson, one of the biggest superstars in the league back then, deeply opposed it because he believed it suppressed hip-hop culture, which in turn suppressed black culture. He was very vocal about it because it was part of his identity, and along with many other players, now they could not embrace it like they want to. There would be multiple run-ins between the organizations, the owners, and the players over the course of Stern's time as commissioner. This was well expected, as I mentioned earlier that the players had way more power compared to before. This would lead to four different lockouts between 1995 and 2011. All of them had to do with the collective bargaining agreements, things that related to the luxury tax or the salary cap or giving small market teams more leverage. Other controversies include some questionable lottery practices, the implementation of a new basketball in 2006 which was wildly unpopular and lasted only a few months, and also there were multiple accusations of rigging or betting on NBA games. Stern was questioned about his involvement in the 2007 Tim Donaghy scandal, but there hasn't been any evidence that showed he was directly involved or if he knew about it. Another incident involved a blockbuster trade. I'm sure everyone knows this by now. In December of 2011, the New Orleans Hornets and LA Lakers agreed to a trade that would send Chris Paul to the LA Lakers. However, Stern vetoed this trade for, quote, basketball reasons. This, of course, led to a huge amount of backlash and everyone was pissed off and confused. Some believed it was because the Hornets at the time were owned by the NBA itself and Stern had the power to veto any trade if he thought it was lopsided. Others believed that Stern was pressured to veto it because at this time, the 2011 lockout just ended and one of the major talking points was to increase parity in the league to promote more competition. 
obviously trading Chris Paul, the best point guard in the league at the time, to a huge market team like the Lakers would be seen very poorly in the eyes of the players and owners. Even to this day, it's still one of the biggest what-ifs in NBA history. In 2012, another monumental precedent was set. In November, Stern fined the San Antonio Spurs organization 250000 for essentially resting their star players in a nationally televised game. Coach Popovich sat out Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, and Danny Green against the Miami Heat. According to Stern, he said, quote, The Spurs decided to make four of their top players unavailable for an early season game that was the team's only regular season visit to Miami. The team also did this without informing the Heat, the media, or the league office in a timely way. Under these circumstances, I have concluded that the Spurs did a disservice to the league and our fans. This opened up a can of worms because it was clear that Stern just wanted to protect the interests of the NBA and its fan base. But obviously for the teams, they're more concerned with a player's health at giving them enough rest, which they should. It's a conflict of interest that even today is still being looked at, with no real solution to please everybody. On February 1st, 2014, after exactly 30 years of being the commissioner, Stern stepped down. All in all, he's widely regarded to be a fantastic commissioner, one of the greatest of any major American sport. He expanded the NBA globally in a way we've never seen before, and also expanded them nationally as he introduced 7 new teams to the NBA, bringing the total number from 23 to 30. It's going to be extremely difficult to live up to what he's accomplished, for Adam Silver and for any future commissioner. Anyway, that's all folks, that sums up the tenure of David Stern. Let me know your thoughts on him and what do you think of his controversial moments. Let me know in the comments, thank you everybody so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.